The reason why I'm doing this Bible basics is because I feel like Bible illiteracy is dangerous and scary and probably happening. Hey man, happening. Um, so I, I want us to go through like, what are the really basic elementary principles that we should know about the Bible? Um, and this is the first one. The Bible is a book. I taught you that the Bible is from the Greek Biblia, meaning book. That's why it's called that. And it's broken up actually into two parts. Um, 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament. Um, and then it's called a testament because it's like a covenant, or like a promise from God, or also a sign or proof, or like a testimony. You can look at it different ways. That's how the Bible is broken up. Um, there's different like uh, sections in each of them. The Old Testament has the Pentateuch, which is the first five books. And then there goes to historical, wisdom, poetry, and prof- prophecy books. In the New Testament, you have the Gospels, which are like... Um, the story and the life of Jesus. You have historical books, which is like the book of Acts, which talks about the history of the church. Epistles are letters. And then prophetic books like Revelation. There's 1,400 years within uh, the entire biblical canon and written by 40 different authors in different languages. And in between the two testaments, you have 400 years. And I talked about that. That's sort of important because um, the time between the Jewish people, Israelites, and um, Jesus coming onto the scene, what did God do to make sure that like the Roman government was in charge and the Jewish people were maybe in turmoil a little bit um, and that crucifixion could happen? So God was even working in the um, supposed silence during that time. The Bible is a book books are meant to be read. It's not meant to be kept on your shelf. But as Protestants... Um, protesting the Roman Catholic Church, we actually believe that all people should and can be able to read the book. And so that's why we're thankful that Bible translators have translated the Bible into English so that we can understand it. Uh, We don't need like a pope or some sort of authority figure to tell us. Um, We believe that God speaks to everyone through his word and everybody should be able to read it. Uh, My second lesson in um, in this topic is that the Bible is canonized. And when I'm talking about canon, I'm talking about that we have all these books here, and it's not like a random collection. We actually believe that God sovereignly arranged all the books together. He made it so that we can discern what books um, belong in that collection. And so you can see here, um, when you're talking about canon, it's not talking about like a like a firing cannon, like a cannon on a ship. It's talking about like a rod. That's what it means. A measuring rod. And so you're measuring the books of the Bible together, seeing like, oh yeah, is, is this book belong? Does this book belong? You're, you're looking at them together. God has given it to his corporate people, determined by God, discerned by men. Okay, so again, we believe that God is the one who determines the books. It's not man. But we do um, need to discern which ones are like actually you know, inspired by God. And they're recognized, not chosen by us. We recognize them. The church has officially recognized these books. If I were to write a book and say, hey, this is a book that I want to add to the Bible, and then the church should be able to say, no, no, we're not going to add that. The canon is closed. I talked about how the books were grouped relatively early. By the time Jesus was on the scene, the Old Testament was pretty much already... Um, in effect, Jesus was able to quote Old Testament passages and he knew his, his scripture. As the New Testament was being written, the early church was able to keep all of it together and just figure out, like, yeah, we should keep this as part of the canon. And they measured it, you know, the early church measured it by these things. And this is also how we can discern it too. Is there beauty and excellence in it? Is there power and efficacy, unity and harmony? Christians can recognize God's voice in Scripture. When you read a book of the Bible, you should be able to say, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, right? You should be able to say, yeah, that's God's Word. Um, And then there's a corporate reception. So it's the consensus of God's people, both Old Testament and New Testament people, us being New Testament people, as a reliable guide to know which books are from God. You think about, like, classics of literature... You think, oh, well, who determines what book is a classic? It's sort of like a consensus amongst the people, you know? And so it's sort of like how the church does that, too. Um, in, in church history, it's different councils that came together. So 
you know, different um, governing boards, leaders, and, and basically just people put together to, for that purpose of determining um, what can we acknowledge as an official book to be accepted as scripture. And this is the one that, you know, that really uh, seals the deal for me in terms of like, how, how can you know if the author claims to be a prophet or an apostle, or it's received directly from an apostle from the book of Hebrews, then that, that gives it a little bit more weight, a little bit more authority. Um, you know, for somebody today to write a book and to say, yeah, I heard directly from the voice of God and he told me to write this down. Um, we, we, we don't believe that. So that's briefly what we went over. And this is what I'm excited to share about today. The Bible is a story, and I'm really excited about this. Kind of nerdy, but I don't even I don't I don't remember this ever being done when I was a student. So I'm going to try to do this for you today. The Bible is actually a unified single message presented in the story of the Bible. So even though they're made up of different books by different authors over a vast period of time, you can tell that there's a cohesive story being told. And it's the story of Jesus, even in the Old Testament. The Bible's plots, movements of creation, fall, redemption, and new creation help us to understand the Bible's message. So this is a framework that people use to help you get the big picture. And when you do this, you think of like a circle, like a plot circle, right? Um, Creation at the top, and then the fall of man, it goes this way, right? And then redemption going upward now, going upward, and then new creation. So, so that's one big way to see the story. You'll hear that referenced a lot, especially in sermons. Okay, Creation, fall, redemption, and new creation. Another way to frame the Bible is this. The Bible story is explained by thinking through how God's plan is unveiled through the covenants. From the creation covenant to the new covenant in Christ. And so when you're talking about covenants, you're talking about God making promises to his people. Next, the Old Testament and New Testament are connected in history. So if you think of the Bible, it's not, you know, it wasn't written by God up in heaven and then like delivered to us. No, it was written to us in history. So there are people who live through different events. And as you look at the Bible as a whole, you can see those different events being played out in actual history. You know, like, like this person was born, and then this event happened. And there's like a chronological sense of the Bible. The Bible is not written outside of space and time, like how God exists outside of space and time, right? The Bible is written in our earthly history. And finally, remember to take the Bible in context, but don't lose sight of the big picture. And so when you're reading the Bible, you need to say, okay, like now that I understand that this happened in history, where does that fall in place? Right? But you don't get lost in the minutia, right? You don't get lost in the details. You still want to remember this big picture of God having a big story to tell and all of it um, lifting up Jesus Christ. Okay, and this is, this is the part that I want to do. I'm going to tell you the storyline of the Bible, a condensed version, Cliff Notes version. And you tell me if you can track along and uh, follow along, okay? So, at creation, okay, this is, this is how I got you. I got to draw little pictures, okay, because I can't just do it off the top of my head. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's what we believe. We believe as Christians that God is our creator. He, he, he made everything that we know, okay? And even before... God made stuff, God just was, right? God was not created, he just he just is. God was there at, at the beginning. And this is this is our beginning. This is all we know, right? When God created the heavens and the earth. And so that's a very fundamental fact of the Bible story, right? God created. Um next, Adam and Eve, right? Adam and Eve. So God created all the animals in the world, created the oceans. He created the mountains and everything, but the pinnacle of God's creation is man. And we believe that we're created in the image of God. We believe that we bear God's image. It's almost as if you can say God has imprinted his image into us. He, he stamped his image onto us, and that, that's what makes humans unique. That's what makes human life valuable is because we're bearers of God's image. The animals don't do that. Nature does not do that. It's, it's mankind that does that. Now... 
Adam and Eve were meant to rule, okay? They were meant to rule the, the garden or whatever, right? Um, but they sinned. So I'm going to draw this little apple right here. Adam and Eve, they sinned. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I got to talk about, like, there's a, like a serpent, right? Serpent Satan, who also was before we know time, right? So th- this is like time, right? This is like historical time begins right here. So Satan did exist before we, we know of. Okay, Satan is a created being, angel, pretty much. Um, and so, yeah, somehow in God's mind, he said, okay, we're going we're gonna to do this. And so Satan was able to tempt Adam and Eve, and they fell. They sinned. They believed the lies of Satan instead of listening to God's truth. And because they sinned, um, they deserve to be punished. Um, sin is rebellion against God. It's going against God's rules, God's standards, God's law, right? And so when God said, don't eat from this tree, this fruit or whatever, and they did it, then that's direct disobedience to God. Now, because they sinned and because they disobeyed, they deserve to be punished. And the punishment is separation from God, right? They got kicked out of the garden. God said, hey, you know, your life is going to be a little bit hard now. And our relationship is severed. And so at this point in time, our relationship, mankind's relationship with God is messed up. Okay, now you got to understand, it's not, we weren't there, right? It's Adam and Eve, but they are the heads of humanity, and that kind of messed up everything that goes on down the line. With the fall, okay, and Adam and Eve, God still was kind to them and gracious. God covered them up. Um, God said that, hey, um, I'm going to take care of this and and god said that uh eve will bear a child and the child will crush the serpent's head and so we're going to see that come into play later but god gave them grace okay he kind of over he he in a sense overlooked it if you really think about it he should have like destroyed them right Uh, but he didn't what he did do though is that he did destroy the world because um mankind was just kind of really bad at that point so god sent the flood okay this is the flood right here God sent the flood. He started over again. Now Noah uh, did survive the flood, right? There's a little ark right here. Noah, put a little like flag right there. That's like cross. So God um, did provide a way for Noah to um, be saved. Earth is flooded, right? Um, eventually the flood waters go away, and we can start over again with Noah. Um, unfortunately, Noah is also sinful. His family is also very sinful. So Noah doesn't pass the test. Um, Earth keeps keeps going. People keep being born and everything. And then eventually you get to the Tower of Babel. Um, I think I'll present it like this. Okay, the Tower of Babel. Now, the thing about the Tower of Babel is that mankind, right at this point, is kind of all in the same place. Um, and they say, okay, we're going to build this big tower to <clears throat> be a big achievement. God says, hey, that's not really good. I want to disperse them around. So God confuses their language, um, and people get dispersed. Okay, and so I'm going to draw like these arrows to see, like, oh, yeah, people like started going around and <clears throat> getting dispersed. <coughs> now, this kind of brings us more to, like, more of the modern times or like more what we think of like biblical history when we think about the Bible. The next big component of this is um, Abraham. So God has his people, right? Even though people disperse all over the place, God still has a people, namely Israel. Okay, and I'm going to represent Israel with this star right here, Israel. And you think about Abraham, okay? And he is like the, the father, the patriarch here of the entire Israelite people, okay? And God promises him. He makes a covenant with Abraham. God says, Hey, um, you Israelite people are special to me. I'm going to promise you, Abraham, that you're going to be the father of this huge nation. And uh, your descendants will have a place here on earth and in my presence. And your people are going to be so numerous. They're going to be like all the stars, right? Like as many stars. That's your people. And so you represent Abraham with, with the star. Okay, now, Abraham, of course, are, is also a sinner. And so, unfortunately, Abraham is not able to see that kind of happen. Okay, he, he does a little bit, but not, not really. Not to the full extent of what we think God is doing. Now, 
if you know the story in Exodus, that's the story of Pharaoh. So you think, okay, somewhere along the line, Pharaoh was in charge somewhere in Egypt, and Pharaoh actually ended up enslaving or being trying to go against God's people. Right? And so you think, okay, now who who is the main actor in, in this Exodus story? Well, it was Moses. It was Moses. And so this is where Moses is born. Moses is an Israelite. But if you remember Moses' story, he gets adopted into the Egyptian family, right? Because the Egyptians are kind of like bullying them. And so the Israelites say, okay, we've got to do something about this. Moses actually gets adopted. He puts him in like the reed, right? In, in like a little boat or whatever. And then like he gets adopted into Pharaoh's family. Now here's where it gets interest, interesting, right? Because now you have Moses, an Israelite, living in with the with the Pharaoh, right? And God's people are still being oppressed at this time by Egypt, by Pharaoh. And Moses raises up in Pharaoh's household, and he's like, "Whoa, this is messed up. These are my people, right?" And Moses knows he's adopted at this point. He's like, "My people are being oppressed. I need to 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 rescue them." God talks to Moses, right? God says, "Hey." You need to do something about this now. And the whole incident with the burning bush and Moses rising against Pharaoh, let my people go, right? That's a big deal. And so here you have Moses with um, parting the Red Sea, right? He parts the Red Sea. He, he, he leads people, God's people, out of Egypt, okay? And then you have the Ten Commandments. Okay, these are, these are the Ten Commandments right here. Ten Commandments. Now, with the Ten Commandments... God is saying, okay, I'm going to write my law for you, okay? I'm going to give you my law. This is what you need to listen and obey, in case you forgot, okay? I'm God. I have rules here. And so Moses, you know, he, 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 he does the Ten Commandments, and then eventually God's people do enter into their own land now. Remember, they were oppressed, and now they're entering into their own land. You have the story of Joshua, right? You have the story of Joshua, the famous story of Joshua leading God's people into um, into Canaan, okay? The conquest of, of Canaan. C-A-N-A-A-N. Now, what happened after that? After Joshua, <coughs> God's people, they start living their lives. They want judges, right? They want to be like the surrounding nations around them. You go through this whole thing of judges and Trying, God's people trying to raise up their own leaders. It doesn't work out. Everybody's still sinful. And eventually they say, no, we don't want to judge anymore, right? We want a king. We want a king now. So David comes on the scene. David, shepherd guy, eventually becomes king over all of Israel. And David builds a temple right here. And so instead of, you know, God's people kind of being like, just kind of around and just trying to live their life of nomads, um, David kind of ushers in this new area where he builds a temple and God's people have a place to worship. Okay, David is the, the king of Israel at this point, right? He's the king of Israel. So, what happens next? God's people are living in their area, but they go through turmoil. Okay, you have the Assyrians, Assyrians, and the Babylonians. Basically, they come in and they... Um, capture the Israelite people. Okay, so remember, we're talking about Israel as, as a nation now, as a people group, and they get overtaken by other people. And God said that. God God sent prophets to say, hey, you guys are still sinners. Um, these bad guys are going to come in and kind of overtake you. You got the Assyrians and the Babylonians. They go into this exile period. Okay, they go into this period where they're taken prisoners, and now, you know, they used they, they were prisoners in Egypt, now they're, they were free, and now they're prisoners again. Right? They go into this period of exile. And God's people are like, dude, what is going on? Where is God during this time? This is when you have all the prophets, right? This this whole period right here, the Old Testament prophets are telling them, hey, you got to repent, you got to come back to God. This this uh, this new ruler ends up taking place. Okay, so this, um, eventually the Syrians are done, the Babylonians are done, and now this new ruler, Cyrus, Cyrus the Great, he's sort of like more of a good guy. Okay, he's still a bad guy, he's more of a good guy. He says, hey, um, you Israelite people, you can actually just go back to your, to your land, okay? I don't want to feel for you anymore. Just go back to your land. You can worship again. Okay, and so now the Israelite people are able to go back home. But during this time, so much has happened. And here is also the rise of the Roman Empire. Okay, so the Roman Empire is already getting built up here. And this is 
what always has interested me too, because at this point in time, right, the Roman government is being in place. You have um, you have different leaders coming up in the Roman government, and you have Roman systems of punishment being created, like the cross. Okay, and so at this point in time, okay, Jesus is born. And I, I think there's a fair thing to say. Jesus is born during this time, okay, when God's people, they've returned, but they're still sort of like scattered. They don't really have like like a, a leader leader. They have like their religious laws in place. They have their religious governing board with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So they're able to do stuff, but that they become corrupted, right? And so Jesus is born on the scene and Jesus is growing up as a boy, starts doing stuff like teaching in the synagogue to, you know, the religious leaders at the time. And somewhere along the line, Jesus says, oh, okay, I'm the Messiah. I'm going to deliver God's people. Now, of course, you know, like that, that's like, that's a mystery, right? Like, how does Jesus go from a baby into be like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to like, you know, he's, he's learning scripture and everything. It's incredible, right? But Jesus grows up and you know the religious leaders they don't like him okay they, they don't like change they don't like this new kid kind of messing around telling them that they're corrupt and they say we're going to kill you and so they do they kill Jesus on the cross <coughs> Jesus has followers at this time right he's like making a name for himself not really you know he's he's just doing his thing but you know he has followers and things and um, everybody's like man what happened we thought this guy was going to be our king. We thought this guy was going to help get us out of like this Roman oppression, you know, and, and God would finally say that, hey, you know, Abraham, your promise is realized and you're going to be taken care of as a nation. Um, but Jesus dies. <clears throat> Jesus comes back to life, empty tomb, and changes everything. Right. Jesus is not the type of leader we thought he was, where he's going to overthrow the Roman, Roman government. Jesus is saying, actually, I'm the leader of people who will believe in me and who want to... It's not even just the Israelite people, but it's the entire world. If you will come to me, I'm going to make a way for you to be with God. Even if you're Roman, then you're going to be with God too if you believe in me. Changes everything, right? Jesus, at this time, um, the church is being built. The disciples are starting to make movements. Scripture is being solidified like what we were talking about. And eventually Jesus says, hey, I'm not going to be with you. Okay, I'm not going to stay here. Um, God's plan is still going to be in effect. I'm going to ascend to heaven, but the church will be built. And you bring people into the church. And when I return, when, when Jesus returns, then he will bring his people to be with God in heaven. Not just the Jewish people, but... Gentiles as well, and that's where we come in. But that that this is where we end up, right? This is this is the church age now, right? And now this, if I were to draw another column, <coughs> I would talk about like end times and stuff. I'm not gonna do that. Okay, this is a biblical story. Obviously, it's a Cliff Notes version. I left out a lot of stuff. I challenge you to be able to try to do something like this. Right? It was hard for me. It took me a while to, to do it. But I, I think um, I think when you do something like this, you're able to see the big picture of scripture it really puts us in context we're like oh man like you know we think that we're like the pinnacle of like church history and everything but not really you know god's story has been played out all throughout the old testament god's story is still being played out right now it's a privilege to be part of god's plan in all of it you know and i think when you do something like this you really um it changes your perception of the entire bible and the way you read it because you're going to be able to slot things right into into history and you're gonna be able to say okay like oh this happened here and this didn't happen yet this didn't happen and you can interpret the bible a little bit better i think it causes you to worship god because you see that god really is sovereign over everything you see that man god really did piece together this entire story it's incredible the way that god was able to move people and kings um and not just that right he moved people's hearts in order to to make all this happen in order for jesus to come onto the scene and uh, yeah, so again, just one more time, I encourage you to try to do something like this. Try to do it better than me, okay? This is kind of shoddy, but um, I think you can do it. I challenge you to do it. Okay, so that that's the whole point of my Bible basics lesson today. The Bible is a story. And as Christians, 
We're meant to tell this story.